yeah, Tess already introduced us, um, but basically this is just like a quick overview. Obviously Maria has her awesome restaurant here in Seattle. Maria, do you want to talk about kind of what you're up to just like for a minute or two? Uh, yeah, so Tilth Restaurant, I have, have had that restaurant for almost 14 years now. And um, Mazam Nutrition just started that up last year. And uh, I'm doing some online nutrition coaching for folks now and uh, working on my level two um, uh, nutrition coaching certification through Precision Nutrition and doing some uh, food and beverage consulting for, for different restaurants around town. And also um, very soon we'll have a energy bar out on the market uh, through a brand uh, called Synergy Foods. So that's kind of what's going on. Awesome. Sweet. Cool. And then you, Mercedes, um, what do you got going on? Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. So right now I actually just started Modus Athletica uh, like full time in last October. So I've been running my own business for the last like seven months, eight months now. Um, but I've had Modus Athletica for maybe seven years or so. Um, yeah. Training climbers mostly online. So that's, that's mostly what I do. Um, and currently I am, uh, helping a lot of people with flexibility training since, uh, you know, we're basically stuck at home. So flexibility is one of those areas that doesn't really tend to be given a lot of attention to. So now is a great time for people to be working on their flexibility. Uh, so that's what I've got going on. Cool. So we're going to start, like, Maria and I were thinking about, like, what is it that we're going to talk about, like, in terms of getting back on the wagon? And I think, you know, we both decided, like, our peak nutrition anchors are the best place to start because it's it's basically the formation of habits. Um, so that's basically how what we're going to be going through. Like our book, Peak Nutrition, it goes through so much more. And the first section of the book is all about these habits. So we thought we would share this with you so you could get a really good idea of how to get started if you're kind of having a hard time right now during COVID and staying at home and, you know, being out of your routine. Um, so really like these habits, there's, um, there's actually seven anchors that we're gonna go through. And like ideally you're going through these maybe like one week at a time or two weeks at a time because habits take a really, you know, it's better to go slow than go super fast and then fail sooner, okay? So it's going pretty slow with each anchor However, it is really up to you. It's your own nutrition journey. And if you want to dabble in each of these anchors, like all at once, that's also totally okay. So anchor number one for, this is like the, probably the most important anchor and habit to develop when eating, well, trying to eat well, because really like there's, there's really no good and bad. And we're going to go over that in terms of like food. There's just how much of something that you eat could turn out to be not great for your health. And so like, no matter what you're eating, the goal is to eat as slowly and mindfully as possible. And in, uh, in Japan, they actually have a saying called hara hachibu. Like they say that at every meal uh, to basically have gratitude for their food and to say, I'm gonna eat slowly and um, gratefully and to 80% full. Um, so this is basically, it's like mindfulness meditation eating. Uh, so you set a timer for 20 minutes and you eat like one bite at a time and you're chewing, like you basically are able to taste your food um, and you're chewing, you put your fork down. Um, ideally there's no distractions while you're eating as well. So a lot of us are, you know, we live in, in the US, probably most of us, and so we're always on the go. So we're like eating while we're driving or we're eating in the kitchen while we're like trying to like answer emails. Um, and this is really just to give you more time to appreciate your food. And, and in the end, it actually, you end up enjoying the food so much more. Um, and that's a good point that Mercedes is making as far as uh, taking that time to really enjoy your food. It's your time to really think about what you're tasting as well, that, that 
you know, the, your, your food is rolling over every part of your palate. So you're hitting that, the, on your tongue, there's an actual flavor map and there's specific points where you taste sweet and salty and sour and spicy. So whenever you're eating something, you really wanna roll all the flavors, everything in your mouth, you wanna roll it through all parts of your tongue so you can really start to understand what the, the balance of those flavors are and enjoy them. Or you might make a determination that it needs just a little bit more salt or a little bit more lemon juice or you know whatever it needs to kind of balance it out. So you're kind of learning how to cook if you take the time to slowly learn how to eat. Yeah, I was, uh... I'm always taken aback whenever Maria tastes my food. She like takes a small bite and then she tells me all of the ingredients without me even telling her what's in the food. I'm like, how do you do that? So Maria's had a lot of practice. I hope, I hope one day I can like list all, all of the ingredients just by like tasting something. That's super <laughs> cool. Um, Thanks, then the second part of this anchor is how do you know, like basically getting to 80% full. And if you eat slow enough, you're, you're gonna kind of understand what 80% full is. And in the end, it's when you check in with yourself, like when you put your fork down, you're like, am I still hungry? And if the answer is yes, then you continue to eat. If the answer is no, like, oh, actually that, that feeling of hunger is now gone. Okay, I don't need to eat anymore. And normally, we're also wired to eat everything off of our plate. And so like taking smaller portions will hopefully take the pressure off of you to finish everything on your plate so that you can actually think about like, am I actually still hungry? Do I really need to continue eating? Um, so that's a really great way to know, like you won't have it down to like, oh, I'm definitely 80%. Like we, you know, that's just like a number that we put out there. Um, really, it's just to the point where you're like, I don't have this cue of being hungry anymore, so I don't need to eat. And then another thing that will help you with that cue of 80% full is um, the, the taking 20 minutes to enjoy your food because it takes 20 minutes for your body to actually process the fact that I, I'm, I'm no longer hungry. So if you have a small plate of food, um, and you finish before, to, well, let's say, let's say you have your plate of food and you like rifle it. You rifle it in like five minutes, you just totally inhale it. Your mind is still gonna be thinking, oh my God, I'm still hungry. But if you allow yourself to wait 20 minutes, then check in there and then ask yourself if, if you're still hungry. If, if it seems like what was on your plate was appropriate given what you've already eaten for the day, um, know that, um, there's kind of that 20 minute mark before your body will actually say, yes, you're full. Yeah. And like taking 20 minutes to eat your food also decreases like abdominal stress. So if you tend to have like cramping, especially at night, so acid reflux, that's generally from eating too fast and too much. Um, so a lot of these things can, could be mitigated just by going a little slower. Um, and a great way to start, like how I started with the 20 minutes is actually, I just like set a timer on my phone um, to see how quickly I was actually eating my food. And then I realized I was eating within like, I think it was like seven minutes, which is like all of my food. Um, so then now it's like, I am the last person to finish my, my meal. And that's actually kind of like a little game that I play in my, in my own mind. I don't tell anyone, um, but it's a good one. So this is the number one, if you're gonna take anything away from this presentation, this is the one that I think that you should try to work on first and foremost before moving on to any of the others. All right, so like, let's go on to anchor number two. Uh, so this is eating whole foods. And the really what we mean is to eat foods that aren't necessarily like that come in packages. So the more fresh things that you can eat, the better. And the more that you're cooking at home, the better. Um, and mostly because like there, there are a lot of chemicals in packaged foods that we don't know enough about. And there has to, like there is a lot of research that show that it can, those chemicals can actually change our, um, 
like the feeling of hunger and also our um, insulin. So like how much sugar we have in our blood. And so it can sometimes affect the hormones in your whole body. Um, so if you can like really try to focus on whole foods, you're going to be able to control a lot more in your diet. Um, so when we say whole foods here, we're saying fruits and vegetables, it can be fresh or frozen, meats, fish, poultry, and eggs, um, whole dairy fat, like fat dairy products, it can be um, low fat if you like. We talk a lot about why whole fat dairy is better um, in the book. Um, and then nuts and seeds, uh, beans and legumes and grains. And I would say yeah. with the, you know, with, with fresh or frozen, you're going to have the same vitamin and, and mineral content um, if, it's, if it's frozen. The thing that's interesting is so, sometimes when you get food that's fresh but out of season, it's not going to taste as delicious as something that is frozen that was actually harvested in season. Texturally, there might be a difference. Like, you're not gonna just take a frozen raspberry and defrost it and be like, oh wow, this is the best textured strawberry I've ever had. But I tell you, it'll probably make a way better smoothie than the greenhouse grown, you know, or out of season grown strawberry with like the little green seeds that's white inside. So, um, you know, from a, a vitamin and, and mineral standpoint, you know, it, it's probably, it's pretty much the same between fresh and frozen, um, but the, uh, the texture is going to be different if it's frozen, um, but also if it's frozen, sometimes you're getting a product that was picked in season, so it can actually sometimes have more flavor. Yeah, totally. And um, some other ways that, that you could introduce more whole foods is, so if you, you kind of like, if you have mostly packaged foods at home, which is like, there's no judgment, you know, you shouldn't judge yourself for like the foods that you're eating. Just know that there's a healthier way for your body to process things and which is like going, eating mostly whole foods. And so if, if you notice like, okay, I'm eating like packaged bread, let's say, if you like a really easy transition would be like, I'm going to say easy. It's, it's not. So if you're eating packaged uh, breads, you could switch to packaged sprouted breads. Um, those are going to be more nutritionally like active. Um, there's more fiber. They're less processed. And honestly, like I love sprouted bread because it makes the best toast. Um, so that, that's one kind of like easy way to like, you just make that substitution. Um, another way could be um, if you like cereals, um, one easy way, especially like if you have kids um, and they like cereals, maybe it's not for breakfast, but they like cereal, you could try to like slowly switch over to oatmeal. Um, oatmeal for sure is gonna have so much more nutritional value per serving than cereal. Cereal is off limits for me because I can eat boxes of those, you know, without <laughs> feeling anything um, because they are less nutritious per serving. So that's just something to keep in mind is that uh, fruits and vegetables are going to be more nutritionally dense per serving than packaged foods. And if I think a lot of times we fall in that trap of eating, uh, you know, processed foods because it's convenient, right? We're busy. We don't have time to cook. Maybe we, we don't want to cook. And so, you know, we, we get some unprocessed foods to, for that convenient piece. But, um, you know, if you go to Whole Foods or if you go to PCC or, or, you know, any natural market, there's such an incredible selection of already, already pre-prepped up vegetables for you, whether it's beets that have already been cooked or, you know, um, like in their salad bar, or uh, maybe it's like broccoli that's already been uh, shredded up. So it only takes you a few minutes to just saute it up in a pan. So there's, there's ways to still gain that convenience of foods, but in a, a more nutritious manner. Yeah, totally. And here is one of Maria's delicious recipes. Yeah, uh, this, which one is this? Uh, this is the uh, 
uh, chicken congee. So it's a, just a, a rice porridge with um, homemade chicken stock. The, the stock uh, recipe is in the book and um, the, the congee recipe is in the book as well. But yeah, great, great one pot dish and really good for your gut. Really, really good to help boost your immune system. My mouth is watering. Awesome. Okay, so anchor number three. This also goes with hydration is switching to either water or zero calorie drinks. So like consuming liquids that have calories, they're so easy to drink and you're going to drink a lot of it because they taste so good. And so those are like what we call like sneaky calories. Um, and those like can easily just add a, like more energy to your body than you need. And obviously like if you eat more energy than your body needs, that's, when you're gonna start gaining weight or you start going toward like high blood pressure or cholesterol issues. Is like Mercedes is frozen. Maria, yeah. take over for a yeah. second. Okay, um, so so carrying on with uh, what Mercedes was saying, um, uh, I think it's great this uh, two to three liters. They actually have these really fun apps that you can download for free on your phone that are water drinking games. So if you're someone who you just get really busy or you can't keep track and you don't forget, they have like these cute, there's one that's like a cartoon and they're like, these cute little llamas, and I think you like fill each llama or something like that every time you have a glass of water. I can't remember what it, what it is, um, but there's a few different ones out there um, to kind of help you keep track of that. Oh, awesome. Awesome. Anything that you can make into a game. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Especially if a cute animal is involved, like that makes it pretty easy. Yeah. Yeah. So... Um, you know, adding electrolytes, herbal teas are awesome. You're going to be able to drink a lot of water if you just put some flavoring in that have no sugar, no calories. Nice. Right. Maria, are you able to hear me? Yes. Okay. Um, and then the last thing, if you do end up drinking things with protein, make it, uh, sorry, with calories, try to make it good. And so for, for me, like, I just like put here like protein shakes, you're gonna get way more per serving rather than just sugar. Um, if you're gonna put some protein in it and a little bit of carbohydrate, maybe even a little bit of fat in whatever shake that you're drinking. Um, and then I'm just gonna like say this, like alcohol has a lot of calories and a lot of sugar, more than maybe you might uh, imagine. So that is just like something to think about um, when you're thinking about like total calories that you're consuming. Tequila on the rocks with a squeeze of lime. There's no grains in it. It's not as many calories and you're kind of getting a, a pretty good bang for your buck if you are looking to kind of take the edge off at the end of your day or something like that. Um, uh, I don't know how Coach Mercedes feels about that, but I, I think that or uh, a dry white wine doesn't have, a dry red wine doesn't have um, as much sugar to it. So you're still getting the, those calories, but um, uh, those are kind of my two go-tos if I'm, you know, at, at a social event or quite honestly, if I'm on a big wall, I'll have, you know, uh, like a, a little bit of tequila at the end of the, the day just because also it doesn't have the grains, so the inflammation isn't quite as um, bad for me uh, with the tequila. Yeah. Isn't tequila and vodka more paleo, something like that? Yeah, yeah definitely. Uh, yeah, yeah, definitely with the tequila, with the, the agave nectar for sure. And then the, the vodka depends because it um, gets distilled with so many different things these days. You kind of have to pay attention to it, but you know, mezcal or, or tequila, like you, you, you're, you're on the right track. Sweet. Well, I'm all about balance and sometimes <laughs> you gotta have some fun or just relax in different ways. <laughs> yeah. Nice. So Maria, why don't you tell us what this is? Oh yeah. And, and also with the, the protein shakes and stuff uh, that 
Mercedes was talking about earlier, we have some recipes in the book, um, really good protein uh, shake recipes in there, along with this one, um, which is a lemon ginger water. Ginger is really good for inflammation and the lemon juice is really great for a uh, electrolyte. So put a little salt and some mint in there and you basically have your own homemade um, electrolyte water as well as something to kind of help with the, the inflammation. So I'll make a big pitcher like this and then just keep it in my refrigerator and sip off of it over a, a couple of days. And for those of you that you know don't like the flavor of just plain water, this is another great one to um, feel like you're having something kind of uh, enjoyable. And you could even strain out the little goodies in the pitcher and put it in a soda streamer and um, you know get some effervescence in there. Awesome. And what I love like about Maria's recipes and these shakes and these waters that you can make is that everything tastes really good. And I think a lot of people think that to eat healthy, you can't enjoy your food because you're supposed to eat like a meat with like nothing on it and like vegetables with like nothing on it. Um, but really like we're, we're trying to change that mindset of like you can eat delicious foods all the time and be super healthy at the same time. Nice. All right. So anchor number four, eating balanced macronutrients. So this one, this slide, there's a lot going on here and going like in the book, we go really in depth in this. So we're not going to talk a, a huge amount, but the first thing is like, you know, understanding, having a better understanding of what your foods are. So each food generally has fat, a protein, and a carbohydrate. There's like some sort of like mixture of percentages of each one in every like natural food. Um, and obviously like, min like minerals and things like that. Uh, but what, what is important is how much of each macronutrient are you getting through the day? And like it is important because one, like a lot of, at least women, that I know have a really hard time getting enough protein, which is our building blocks for being strong and just like functioning in general. Like all of our tissue is made out of protein. So anytime that it's time to regenerate new cells, you need a lot of protein. So that's why it's really important to have protein right after working out or when you're exerting a lot of energy because now your body is going into restoring itself, but you have to supply it with those building blocks. Um, and then fat, fat is kind of like our long-term storage. Uh, when you eat fat, it doesn't necessarily go into storage. Fat breaks down and then goes, you know, everything break, basically breaks down into sugar except for some of the proteins um, and then reforms back into either fat, protein, or other, like it helps to package per, um, hormones and things like that. So eating fat is really important because it gives us kind of like the glow on our skin. It helps with our nervous system because it packages all of the nerves um, and so many other functions in the body. Like hormones is like a huge one that fat really helps with. And then carbohydrates are like our short-term energy needs. So uh, in, the, in our muscles, sugar is actually like stored in the muscle. So when we exert those, the, that sugar is just dropped into our bloodstream and then that's how we can use that quick energy. And so that's why like when you're out hiking and you're, or you're doing a really long ascent or something, it is really important to continue that stream of carbohydrate. Sometimes where we go wrong is when we're not being active and we're eating the same amount of carbohydrate, but we're not using it. So that's when it starts to turn into fat, stored fat in the body. And I think also with the carbohydrate, um, uh, making sure if you can that it's a, a healthy, uh, unrefined carbohydrate. Like when uh, Mercedes is saying, you know, sugar that it it converts to sugar, but she's not literally saying like sugar. <laughs> you know what I mean? To to keep going because that'll, you know, that'll. Uh, definitely give you a big insulin spike, and when you get that insulin spike, you'll you'll kind of bonk or you'll go below your your baseline uh, energy level. So if you have something, I mean, there's quick carbs and slow burning carbs and quick carbs, but 
that they're still healthy, unrefined carbs. Like if you wanted to have like some berries or, you know, strawberries, banana, or, or, you know, a potato or something like that. Those would be really quick carbs that your system uh, can have access to right away. And then if you're doing something endurancey, also layering on those slower carbs, like, you know, the oatmeal or um, some legumes uh, or pulses or, or something like that. So, um, you know, you'll start to receive the benefit of those carbs, you know, a couple hours later. Yeah, it's a really good point. And carbs aren't evil, no matter what anyone tells you. Carbs are not evil, um, <laughs> especially if you're active. Um, you know, there, there are people who can run off of a lot of fat in their diet, and some people cannot. Um, and, you know, through experimentation, which we'll talk about, you're going to find that out. Um, Okay, and then, so what does a balanced macronutrient meal look like? So in the book, we go- one go back, Mercedes, on the, on the carbs? Like, yeah. um, you know, if, if you're doing a big, long endurance day or multiple endurance days, um, then, you know, kind of uh, having more carbs the night before is, is totally fine. Would you, wouldn't you say, Coach? Yeah, I would say- it's almost, it's almost like kind of what you were saying about like having that sugar and then all of a sudden the insulin spikes. So the night before, you don't want to go overboard with your carbohydrates because if you also, if you haven't experimented with carbo loading, um, it might end up being uh, harder for you to get that energy the next day. So if you eat, actually, if you eat too many carbs, it could have a reverse effect. Um, so I would say like, make sure you kind of know how much carbohydrate you really need, um, instead of like taking a bunch of carbs out to the crag and then eating it the night before, um, and never like experimenting with it. Um, but in general, like, yeah, endurance athletes will eat more carbohydrate around their big training cycles or their big events for sure. Yeah. Um, Okay, yeah, so what does a macronutrient meal look like? So in the book, we go over hand sizes. And so like, the reason why we chose the hand is because it's easy to visualize rather than taking a scale and like weighing your food, um, especially if you're eating out a lot, you know, um, if you can eyeball your food, that's best. And so like for protein, so any kind of like protein that you have, we talk about getting a palm, of protein at least at minimum and for men that's going to be probably double this so it's the width and the size of your palm is how much protein you should have per meal and then uh, for carbs it can be like a fist of carbohydrate and we actually separate carbohydrate and vegetables vegetables are a form of carbohydrate but when we're talking about carbs in a meal we're actually talking about more like the slow digesting carbohydrates like potatoes, slow potatoes, rice, um, you know, things like that. So you can try to go like a fist full of that and then also a fist or a handful of vegetables. And you don't need to stick to that. You can always have more. More vegetables is a-okay. Um, and then and so the last- If you're thing. hungry, that's what you should go for. Like if at the end of your day, you're like, oh man, I'm still really hungry. Like eat as much broccoli as you want. Just go for it. Yes. Yeah, totally. Um, and then for fat, the last thing is just like the thumb tip. So you want one to two thumb tips per meal. So that includes the oil that you're using to cook whatever it is that you're cooking. Okay. Um, yeah. Otherwise, like if you like numbers, we give just like a quick percentage breakdown here. Um, so if you're fairly active, your general um, intake could be 30% fat, 30% protein, 40% carbs. You could also uh, do a little bit less protein, so 25% protein, and put that into the fat category if you'd like, um, because it is really hard to get 30% protein. That's like around one, around one pound like of, uh, per body weight. 
So that would be like a hundred and like for me, it would be 130 grams of protein, which would be so much protein. Um, so if you're getting, you know, around 25%, that's like, that's good. That's good enough, especially if you're active. And when, when it comes to carbs, uh, I'm randomly seeing questions here and there. We're, we're doing, we'll, we'll be doing Q and A at the end, but um, there, some of them are catching my attention. Um, if you are a big fan of pasta, my recommendation would be to try and um, find, pros, uh, find you know, pasta that uh, ha has very minimal ingredients and, and finding ones that have some whole wheat or maybe some emmer flour or, or chestnut flour, but one of those flours that um, still maintain a lot of uh, nutrients to it. If it's if it's just all-purpose flour or whatever, everything's been stripped out of it, so you um, you're you're not getting the nutritional density that you could. So with everything, there's always a happy medium, and if like pasta is a go-to, then try and focus on um, maybe some of those more interesting flowers, even legume flowers. They have like, you know, chicky flowers and, and stuff now that are pretty interesting. Okay, sorry, coach. No, you're good. You're gonna tell me what this delicious meal is here. Yeah, uh, blackened shrimp with crispy kale and uh, creamy polenta. So I, I chose this as something that is um, pretty well balanced, uh, the, the Creamy polenta, it's a, it's a thin layer. I know it looks larger in comparison, but it's a, it's a thin layer. But um, that uh, is a, a pretty good example in the book of um, your protein, uh, fats, and carbs. And shrimp is probably one of the easiest ways to get your protein. Like a couple shrimps is going to be like 20 grams of protein or something. So if you are ever like, oh, I need like an extra 10, 20 grams of protein, you could just fry up some shrimp because sh and shrimp is delicious. Um, so that is like a good, good thing to like keep in the back of your mind, like shrimp and sardines, I think are some of the easiest and for the, the amount of volume, like with meat, you kind of have to eat a little bit more. Um, whereas with sardines and shrimp, you don't have to eat as much volume to get your protein. All right, anchor number five, eating local, seasonal, and organic. Uh, Maria, I'm gonna let you take the reins on this one. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, so the first thing that we're talking about is why. Why would we wanna eat local, seasonal, and, and organic? Um, and it is often more nutritionally dense. Um, it tastes a lot better, and uh, it's better uh, for the environment and for um, uh, animal husbandry as well. And I will say my journey uh, down this road of, you know, being local, seasonal, and organic did not start with um, uh, the environment. Um, it actually started because it just made food taste better. So, you know, in the kitchen as a chef, I just really noticed the difference. If I had a tomato that was in season, um, the flavor on it is, is so much better. And um, as it turns out, if you're, if you're getting it in season and if you're getting it locally, then it hasn't traveled a far distance to get to you. So it's better on the planet in that sense. Um, as well as uh, there's a shorter amount of time from the, the time that that tomato has been taken off the vine and is on your plate. And um, that uh, shortness in time uh, allows for there to be a higher density of uh, vitamins and minerals because it's, it's not you know, just, just slowly degrading. Um, and a couple of places to be able to access is uh, going to uh, farmer's markets, um, growing your own food if you can, if you have an apartment, even like a little herb box or something, some cute little cherry tomatoes, um, just something you know is wonderful. Um, shopping at a local co-op, um, and then uh, buying in the bulk section very often is gonna be local. And if you wanna know what's in season, you can look online and find um, seasonality charts, and that'll, uh, you know, that'll give you a pretty good idea. Um, if you don't have a, a farmer's market that's close to you. And then 
You may even want to look for a CSA package in your area. I think um, you know the biggest struggle is for people who live in a in a food desert. And let's say you live in a food desert and you're you're too busy to to cook. You know, potentially maybe there's um, a CSA program that's uh, close to you, or you could check with a couple of neighbors and and pull something together and see if you can get one started. Um, but uh, yeah, all the local seasonal organic, it's gonna taste better, it's gonna be better for you, it's it's easier on the planet, will help kind of lower your, your carbon footprint. Um, and then when it comes to the oceans as well, uh, Monterey Bay Seafood Watch, they do a really nice job of letting you know what fish is, um, uh, you know, what seafood is, is sustainable in your area so we can, um, be a little uh, kinder and gentler to our oceans as well. Yeah, and Maria does talk a lot about the impact on the environment. Like, it's actually quite surprising how much like gasoline and labor it takes to have to transport food. And if you're eating local, especially in the times that we are right now, eating local is going to be better for everybody in the long run, for economy, uh, for your health, and, you know, for supporting local farmers, you know. Um, a lot of the time getting fruit from like South America, those farmers are not getting paid anything, you know, and we reap those benefits from uh, getting our food imported that way. So you know, that we do have to be really grateful for having these foods that come from so far away when we do get them. And I've, I've done this fun thing that, um, where I, act, I kind of did this like local for diet. So I ate food. Well, what was, you know, you can kind of make up your own little rules, but especially in the summertime, like how Mercedes is saying, now is like the time if you're going to make a little game out of it and eat only local for a month or two weeks or whatever you want to set up for yourself. Now's a really good time to do it. But I, I took the Cascadia bioregion. Um, so the, the Cascadia bioregion is, it's, it, it's, it's kind of hung, it's framed around the Northwest, but it's not by uh, political or state borders. It's based off of, um, rivers and actually the evergreen tree system and that kind of makes up the Cascadia border. So it dips a little bit down into Northern California, which we know they have the, the super kind produce down there as well. And it goes, you know, through Idaho, through the Snake River, and then even up into the into the BC area. But if you look online, you'll see like a Cascadia bioregion um, map and uh, you can you can eat quite bountiful in our region. We are very, very lucky to be, uh, those of you who are in the Northwest, sorry if you're not, <laughs> but um, uh, you know, all regions, there's, um, you know, great, great uh, bounty and you can eat super well just, just in, in your, your area. Of course, I had chocolate and um, coffee as my two exceptions. They had to be, you know, uh, the coffee had to be at least roasted here in Seattle and, and the chocolate had to be bean to bar in the area. Um, but outside of those two things, I mean, even the sugar, I was using rice sugar or, you know, rice syrup and, and beet sugar and honey and, and stuff like that. So you can get, you can get quite creative and it, it's really eye opening to realize, wow, there's the, there's a lack of transparency of food in our food system. You know, if you go to PCC, do they do a really good job of letting you know where your food comes from? But, you know, I thought I was pretty savvy about, you know, where my food came from. But when I did that little exercise, I realized that it's really hard to find out where a lot of your produce, your produce is from, unless you're shopping at, you know, PCC or, or at a farmer's market, a co-op. Oh man, we should totally do a challenge together and invite people to, to eat local. I think that would be awesome. It's super fun. It's really, really cool. And you, you get really creative and you actually start, um, uh, you know, you get your cook mind on. So you get really nimble and you're like, Oh my God, I always get these things. Now I can't have these things. And, um, yeah, it's, it's pretty cool. Yeah. I'm in, let's do it. Yeah.
Oh, there we go. Well, speaking of, I had to put one of my favorite farmers, Annie, on here from King's Garden. Met her at the uh, farmer's market and she is located in uh, her farms in, uh, in the Metal Valley and she just does an incredible job. She just, she still to this day comes driving up to the restaurant on her truck and we buy right off her truck. We never know what she's going to bring us and it's always right in the middle of the dinner rush. So it's not <laughs> the most convenient time, but um, you just can't say no to Annie. That's awesome. And yeah, also supporting your restaurants, your local restaurants that buy local and prepare food locally. Um, I think that was, that's a good way to, you know, support the local economy. For sure. All right, we're almost done. Anchor number six, getting to know your own eating habits. And so like, this is really just a, a, like an exercise, like maybe as part of eating slowly, eating to 80% full, is being more mindful about when you eat, like the time of day, when you're eating, is it like the things that you're eating, is it based off of your emotional state? Is it based off of the stress level that you have? Or is it that you've actually planned ahead? Um, and you're like, oh, I prepared this whole, like my whole week and I'm just going to grab food. Um, you know, like we make a lot of decisions based on our emotions. And so food is going to be the number one thing we're going to, uh, I guess, give into. So if you have a selection of things at home and you're not feeling great that day and you're like, F it, I'm just going to like eat this thing that makes me feel really good. Great. You know, you're going to go for that. And that's, again, that's okay. This is more just an exercise of understanding when you eat certain things and understanding how your emotions affect your eating. Yeah, and like if you're really craving something, that's an, that, well, if you're really craving something, it could be an indicator that you are eating for an emotional or, or stress reason. It, I mean, it could also be because you're craving something like, you know, if, if um, you're uh, getting ready to start your menstrual cycle and you're craving chocolate, it's because your body really wants the magnesium. And so, you know, if you um, are craving chocolate, really, it's just that your body wants the magnesium. But I think to what Coach Mercedes is, is um, focusing on here is like, you know, if, if you're stressed out, like for me, I just want to eat a truckload of sugar and kind of like drink my face off at the end of the night. And it's like, you got to check in with yourself and be like, okay, why do I want to do this? And you know, think about alternative um, things that would be better for you and, you know, make, make your mind and your body feel better. Yeah. And it, it is, uh, if it's in the house, it's going to get eaten by someone, probably you. Okay. So that's also part of it is like, if you know that you have certain foods that, you know, uh, in the book, we list them as red light foods, uh, the yellow foods and the green light foods. The red light foods are the ones that you know you're, you won't be able to stop yourself from eating. And the, the like frequency from like food to mouth is really high. So like there's just like this constant stream of eating and you can't stop yourself. Like binge, basically getting into like this binge eating mode. Um, labeling those foods and just being like, oh, those are red light foods. Okay, like good to know. Maybe I shouldn't have those in the house very often. Because again, if it's in the house, it's going to get eaten. Um, and if you take foods away and you only have certain things in your house, the decision fatigue, um, so that's one of the things listed here, um, at the, especially at the end of the day, you're, you're not going, going to make good decisions because you have just made over 100 decisions through your workday um, or at home or whatever it is that you're doing before you have even had dinner. And so we're trying to eliminate this like needing to make a decision. If there's just like one or two things to choose from, that's all you get. Okay. Okay. So that makes it really easy. Um, and that's especially when you go to the grocery store, make sure you don't go to the grocery store when you're hungry. That is the worst thing you could do. Make sure you eat something before going in. And with the decision fatigue, like I, the red light foods that I can't have in the house, those are the foods that like, I really want when I'm stressed out. 
Um, so I put, I make sure I have replacers. So I'm still making a smart choice. Like I get these little sugar-free caramels that um, are limited ingredients and I like keep those around. Um, the moon cheese, like the little freeze dried moon cheese, like whenever I want potato chip or like that salty crunchy thing, like that or a dill pickle or, you know, um, that sort of thing. So you want to like have those replacements around for when you do have that craving. So you're reaching for the, the right thing. And then with your red light foods, um, a really good friend of mine gave me the advice once. Uh, she's a nutrition coach and she was like, your house is your temple. So like that food shouldn't be in your house, but if you want it, get a single portion and go sit on a park bench and eat it. So if like, if you really want that, like cookie that's, you know, loaded with sugar and refined flour and all that sort of stuff, get the cookie, make sure it's something that's delicious. Like you really enjoy it. Like don't get like a shit cookie, get like your favorite cookie go to a park bench or, or wherever and like enjoy that one cookie. Like don't come home with like a pile of cookies and, and put it in your, in your cabinet. So you don't want to take things away from yourself. You want to find ways to be able to replace it or delay the, the gratification of it. Yeah. Yeah. And I like that you said, like, make sure that it's the thing that you really want. Um, I kind of like think of calories as like my money. Like, this is like my allowance for today. And how am I best going to spend my allowance? And I'm always going to choose like the best thing, um, especially when it comes to sugar. Like, I'm not going to spend my, my sugar calories on something that's like, meh. You know, it's always going to be something amazing. Um, so it's like, sometimes that can help just that visual of like, here's your daily allowance or weekly allowance or whatever it is. Okay. And then meal prepping. That's uh that's great that you you brought up the the meal prepping. That that definitely helps out. And having some nice healthy snacks around is is really great. I'm mean, for me in the middle of the day like it having time to actually sit and have a meal can be quite a challenge. So a lot of times like I'll um very mindfully eat dinner usually. And then at lunch times, a lot of times I'm, um, you know, I'm at my computer and I'm working and like I have to work through lunch. And so when that happens, having things that are pretty easy to eat, but are healthy, like carrot sticks are great. Um, you know, uh, sliced up beets are, are great. Um, and both of those, like they're, they have a nice sweetness to it and, you know, a little bit of crunch to it. And if you just have some hummus dip or, or peanut butter, or I have some, we have some dips in the, in the cookbook, um, some healthy dips that are great in there that you could use for, you know, something that, that you would dip with. But um, yeah, or, or you can buy the vegetables already cut up for you. You can buy cauliflower, you know, that's already in florets and, you know, baby carrots and, and all that sort of stuff to kind of cut down on the amount of prep that you need to do. Yeah. Yeah, I think meal prepping has been the key for me to really like changing how I eat. Um, because really I only have to cook once a week because I don't have time to cook just like probably most of you to cook every night. Um, and meal prepping really has changed everything for, like in my life too, you know. That's great. And you can stock your freezer up too. It's like with the the bar recipes in the book, I'll make three dozen at a time and I'll just keep them in my freezer. And then when I go to the crack, I just go in the freezer and pop out a couple bars and I don't have to worry about, you know, stopping at a gas station and getting like a bag of nasty chips or anything like that. Cause I've kind of set myself up in advance. Yep. Um, it looks as though we need to start getting to questions soon. So sorry, I keep yammering. <laughs> <laughs> well, okay. This is the last one. Basically, you know, we're not going to tell you how to eat. And I don't think that anyone should really tell anyone how to eat. Because in the end, you know your body best. We can give you guidelines, but you're going to know what's best for you. And we give you uh, certain ways, like we, we go over keto, we go over intermittent fasting, we go over paleo. Uh, we also have plant-based diet. 
So like you could basically choose one and try it for two weeks and see how you go. If you realize, okay, like two weeks usually is a decent enough time. I would say keto might need longer for experimentation um, because your body does need to adapt. But other like the plant-based and the paleo and intermittent fasting, you will see changes pretty quickly, whether it's good or bad. Um, so, you know, make sure that you're treating your body kind of like your own laboratory. You can do extremes, which isn't necessarily good. So don't like things that I would definitely stay away from are like super low calorie diets. Those are just not going to be good. You know, like your body needs calories to function. If you start depriving your body of calories, um, it's going to start shutting down and you're not going to function at your peak performance. So, you know, we, we can, we go over how to calculate your calorie needs in the book and then, you know, try to keep those calories in mind when you're looking at other ways to eat. And if you're experimenting with the, the diets, I highly suggest journaling. Journal your sleep, journal your energy level, um, and, and what it is that you're actually eating and when. Um, because I like I've done I've like I've gone full plant-based, I've gone paleo, I've gone, you know, keto, and it's like they all have their little nuances and your body is gonna um, either, you know, uh, respond well to it, or it might take a while for it to respond. So you'll need to start making some tweaks and some changes. So if you have that data, you'll have a better understanding on when things are going off track before you go off the rails or, um, just how to kind of tweak and, and make things a little bit better. And also make sure that, so if you're going to experiment that, um, you are seeing a doctor, uh, mostly because of blood testing. You have to make sure that your blood tests are good. Because uh, if, if, you, if you don't have regular checkups and you start to really experiment, you know, we're not doctors and we're never gonna like prescribe anything, you know? Um, really, you have to know like if you have some sort of condition, whether a, a certain diet is good for you. So, you know, make sure you're getting regular blood tests and that you're talking to your doctor, your doctor probably won't really know, like honestly, um, about certain diets, but they know, they will know about your conditions and like some things that will help or maybe make it worse. So um, make sure you're communicating with your health provider. All right, so that is basically it. Here's our resources. So if you wanna get in contact with our, either of us, feel free to email us. Um, mine is info at Modus Athletica. Uh, Maria, hers is uh, Mazama Nutrition, so info at Mazama Nutrition. And if you, I, I know we didn't have a whole bunch of time for, for questions, so that's where you can find us for questions. And um, Tess, is there a way for everyone to let us know if they would like to see us do another webinar? This went by really fast. And Mercedes yeah, it, it went by super fast. You guys packed in so many, so many amazing tips. I could have listened for another hour. So I think people would definitely be up for another one. Um, they can email me. They, everyone who registered has my email address. So they can absolutely email me if they're interested. Um, and another uh, amazing webinar and what they would like to hear. And also I just, you guys, I wanted to show your beautiful book. Yeah. <laughs> I wanted everyone to see it. And it's 25% off on our website. I just dropped the link in our chat. It's with the code time to read. Um, they have so many great recommendations in here. Um, so many great questions. I'm gonna just go through a few questions really quickly because we did promise people a few questions. So do you guys have time, Mercedes and Maria? Yeah, let's do it. Okay, great. Um, monk fruit as a sugar substitute. Uh, I just, I just put a, I just, uh, oh, you just did. Oh, I don't, I don't know if I spelt it right, but erythritol. Erythrit, erythritol and, or swerve, swerve sweetener. It's supposed to say swerve. Yeah. Swerve. So swerve is, it's a, I believe swerve is a blend of erythritol and stevia. Um, there's also, if you look online, there are sugar substitute charts because when I was cooking keto, um, that was a challenge for me to find the right 
you know, sugars that I was, if I was baking, um, you know, the erythritol does a direct translation to granulated sugar. So that's really nice. Monk fruit, depending on the brand, the different monk fruits, they all taste different. Like I've had a couple of different mm -hmm. brands and they taste vastly different. They have like a pretty strong bitter on the back end. So you have to like really like taste how much you're using that. And same with uh, stevia it has that same kind of bitter back. Um, so something to think about. And then, you know, I, I think this is a question a lot of people have. Is there a formula for how many grams of protein someone should get in a day based on weight and calories consumed, activity level? Yeah, in the book, we'd say 0.8 grams per uh, pound of body weight. Um, but Here's the thing about numbers is that it's not human. So like, you know, we're all gonna, some people can actually process proteins easier and actually can make their own proteins from plant-based foods. Whereas other people, I'm definitely one of these people where I need to get a lot of external protein. Um, so, you know, I think at minimum, if you can get like 80 grams of protein a day, you're like winning, you're winning. Um, and then anything over that, that's like a bonus. Um, but you know, in the book we do say like around 0.8 to like one, 1.2 grams. Okay. That's super helpful. And then we, a few people have asked this question, um, the nutritional value of dehydrated or freeze dried food for backpacking. Yeah. Um, so it's really interesting that the process of freeze drying food is, is, is just uh, just that. So you just take a, a raspberry, you put it in the freeze dried machine, and you know, and there you go. It's been freeze dried, so you don't lose any of that. You don't lose any of the um, vitamins or, or minerals. Like you, you get that same nutritional value. Now with the dehydrated, it, it, I guess it depends on the on the product. Um, uh, you're I, I you're gonna have more nutrition if you make it yourself but i completely understand like dehydrating all your own food in the back country is like it can be kind of a pain in the ass like to be fair so um if you are having dehydrated food um what what i do is i'll find like some soba noodles so it has that buckwheat and there's like at least some sort of nutrition in there and then I'll get freeze dried vegetables and kind of like put a little combination of those things together. We have a couple of freeze dried recipes in the book, or I'm sorry, dehydrated recipes in the book. The thing with the dehydrating is you want to make sure you're dehydrating things at a low enough temperature that um, you are maintaining the vitamin, vitamins and minerals because once you go past a certain temperature, um, you do start to, they do start to degrade on you. And I, I can't remember exactly what that number is. I think it might be like a hundred and maybe it's 126 degrees or something. I would have to double check. But if you Google um, what temperature is still considered raw food, um, that's the temperature that, that you're looking for. So it's absolutely below a boiling point, which is 212. Um, and I feel like it's somewhere in that 125, 130 range, um, but I'm not entirely, I, not entirely sure. Another question that's been asked a few times, do you guys have any good recommendations for protein sources for vegans? Uh, yes, I mean, uh, you know, tofu is great, seitan is great. I, I would say, I don't know, a lot of times it's hard for your body to digest though, you know, um, uh, and, and tofu can very often, you know, soy products can kind of wreak havoc with your system uh, with some people. Um, protein shakes, uh, Vega uh, brand, that Vega Sport, it is a vegan protein shake and they have like mocha, vanilla and chocolate and I'm omnivore and I love it. I swear by it. I think it's, it's really great. It has like 30 grams of protein in it. So um, if I'm in a heavy training cycle and I'm really trying to put on some muscle, then I'll be shooting for that, you know, at least a hundred, 120 grams of protein a day and um, supplementing with that protein shake 
that's 30 grams right there. And then I made myself this little nerdy protein chart because I know when I really focus on it, like Coach Mercedes says, it's really hard to get that much protein in. So you really have to be thoughtful and like put a menu together for yourself if you're trying to hit a certain protein number and find those go-to items that um, have a lot of protein, like whole fat cottage cheese or these protein shakes. And if you do use a protein shake, you want to find something that has the most bioavailability of the, the protein. A lot of times it'll say that it has 25 or 30% protein, but your body can't actually absorb all that protein. So that's something that you really need to be aware of. Um, and that's why I feel good about the, the Vega brand because um, I, I think it has like a pretty good uh, bioavailability to it. Awesome. Yeah. yeah. Um, like Vega and uh, Thorn Research have some of the better quality plant protein. Like even just like um, Thorn has like really great uh, supplements. Like I would 100% trust all of their products. Um, and they have a really good plant based uh, protein powder. Um, but yeah, and, and in general, like per meal, you don't really want to eat more than 30 grams. Just like what Maria was saying, like don't eat more than 30 grams per meal because it, like within an, an hour, um, your body's not going to really take more than that. It, it can't digest it. Um, and I just wanted to d like double check, but we have a whole like table here of like what kind of athlete you are and how much protein we suggest for like each category. So endurance versus strength versus like mixed athlete. All right, we have time for one more question. Everyone is asking so many good questions. Um, you know what I'm excited about? Every single one of these questions, I think every single one, the information is in the book. I'm like, holy shit, we wrote a pretty good book. You nailed it. <laughs> I think most of this stuff is in there. It is. It is. I mean, I have taken so many notes on the book myself. Um, so this was asked in the beginning of your guys' uh, presentation. Um, should someone aim to eat till 80% full when they're in the back country? And then they say, sometimes I just get so hungry when I'm out there. Get it. Eat it. Just yeah. get it. Like okay. you're moving your body and you have, you know, you, you, you definitely need those calories. I, I will say though, if it's going to keep you up at night, like if you, um, eat a big meal, like how Mercedes was saying earlier, um, that could keep you up at night, disrupt your sleep and then make your body just like grind down and have to work even harder. So, I mean, for the win, I would say try and pace out your calories throughout the whole day instead of having them at the end of the day. But like I have been there <laughs> where you're working your body hard. It's like super hot and it's the end of the night and you're like, I haven't eaten anything all day. I'm on my portal edge. It's 10 o'clock at night and I'm going to rifle everything in my bag right now. So, um, you know, you, you can do that. It, it, it's a little bit harder for your body to digest. So ideally pace your calories throughout the day, but if you don't have an opportunity to, then yeah, load up. Well, you guys, I'm already getting emails in my inbox of people saying that they're interested in another webinar, like literally Great. they're popping up right now. So I think, that, I think that we have another one planned. I'm sorry to the questions we didn't get to. We will send out um, an email in the next two days with the recording and um, Maria and the Mercedes ways that you guys can get in touch with them directly. Um, thank you guys for an amazing presentation and your time. I learned a lot and I really, really thank you so much. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks. Thank you both. All right. Thanks everyone. Have a great night. Thanks everyone. Thanks for joining us. Okay. Bye. Bye.